Hey everybody, Professor Skiles here with a brief video lecture on isms of the 20th century. Now you might recall we've just learned about realism and naturalism, and I forced the endings of those words to help you understand that's where we are. Realism and naturalism, of course, people trying to behave on stage exactly as they would in real life. It's the laboratory of life embracing the scientific method. Well, we're going to get bored with that. Even though realism is still with us today on stage, people wanted to explore new things. So, once again, why the change? Well, unfortunately, when all you see on stage is people behaving as they do in real life, and then you have World War I and World War II, you don't want to see people on stage behaving exactly as they do in real life because real life is pretty god-awful right now. So, this starts to encourage people to create new forms. Realism, they feel, is spiritually bankrupt. If all you do is show people's thoughts and actions on stage based on environment and heredity, where is man's purpose? What is the higher power? What can we talk about that goes beyond realism? And, quite honestly, people just need a change. We get bored. Think about how music has changed in your lifetime, or fashion, or even the popular colors for your home. These things run in cycles, long cycles, and uh, we're constantly sort of changing things up just to keep things interesting. Reality TV, as it was born in the MTV network, the real world, is nothing like reality TV is now. But what are these isms? Well, you can jot these down. We start with symbolism, and this is actually starting very much with realism at the same time. But what is symbolism? Theater or art or music, because they're all transitioning at the same time. It emphasizes the symbolic nature and abstract possibilities of meanings, and it replaces that spiritual bankruptcy of realism. And so it starts to play off of things that we see and meanings that may not always seem apparent. So if we look at this shot of a production, we don't know anything about the production except it probably focuses on the passage of time in some way, because the scenic designer has given us a great focus on time and time ticking away, and we say that time flies when you're having fun. But you also acknowledge, do you remember sitting in your school for the last 10 minutes of the school year before summer and watching how slowly that tick-tock, that grind can be? So time is a symbol. Chess is a symbol. We've got the black and white pieces. We've got pieces that are castles and horses and bishops and queens and kings. It is said that chess was invented to simulate war and the strategies of war. And that black and white checkerboard, we even have floors designed that way. And obviously this gentleman here is not happy with the outcome of the game. But the pieces and the board represent something else. They're symbols. Three very famous symbols here. This is where we get into philosophy. If I ask you what these symbols are, let me start by asking you, what do you see? Well, you might say a cross, but a cross is a symbol. If I am an artist, I might say I see a sculpture. I see three uprights, each one of different height, made out of maybe metal or wood, and each one has a little tiny cross piece almost at the top, and they're arranged in a way from lowest, highest, middle. That's just the artistic view. That's just the composition. But it means so much more in religious parlance. It might mean the Trinity to you because of three in one. It might mean the crucifixion of Christ. For you, it might mean the hill of Golgotha, the hill of the skull where the crucifixion took place. It might bring to mind the story of Jesus on the cross with the two robbers. 
One of them repents, and Jesus says, today you will be with me in heaven, and the other one does not repent. And so symbols have so much more meaning than just the actual pieces. This is a very famous painting by an artist, Georgia O'Keeffe. She loved painting flowers, but her flowers were symbols for the female body. So even in painting, and of course in music, we have this symbolism ideology. This is a theatrical play where man is being taken over by the Industrial Revolution. Man is being replaced by machines and robots. You can see a very stark look here in the design that his hands are gone and there are nothing but cogs and wheels to replace them. All right? Then we have expressionism. We've got all these symbols built in. Now let's go a little bit further. Expressionism, theater that greatly exaggerates perceived reality to express inner truth. It's not concerned with reality. The feelings and the emotions are central. And I start with one of the most famous paintings in the world, Edvard Munch's The Screen. This is a man on a bridge, and he's not having a good day. But this is not photographic quality. This is very expressive painting, the sky, the water, even the screen. This painting was the inspiration for Macaulay Culkin's face in Home Alone, where he would slap the sides of his face and scream. So it's not realistic. It's trying to express the inner feelings of that scream. Incidentally, this is the most stolen painting in history. I don't know if that speaks to poor security at the museum where it's housed. Of course, it always finds its way back to the museum because it's not like you can hang this in your living room and brag about having stolen it. But expression. This is Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night. This is expressive, right? There's a church down there. What some people think of a mountain on the left-hand side of the screen, that's actually a cypress tree, and the sky is full of the movements of the heavens, the moon and the stars, the wind and the clouds. And there's nothing photographic or realistic about it, but it evokes a feeling. It expresses something greater than just the realistic picture. Here's Gustav Klimt's The Kiss. I don't know if you've ever had one of these kisses before, but now it looks like she's slightly uncomfortable. She's on her knees, but they're wrapped in this cloak of gold, and there is real gold leaf in the original painting. And that feeling of being cradled and cuddled and kissed gently, that wonderful feeling of a kiss. This is not really what a kiss looks like, but it's what a kiss feels like. Here are some puppeteers puppeteering a figure. Now, we see that these are humans controlling a puppet, but there's symbol here, and there's expressiveness about maybe that the puppet is a real human being being manipulated by greater forces. There's a very famous uh, portrait of My Fair Lady where George Bernard Shaw is the puppet master for Eliza. So this ideology that we are not in control of our own actions is very expressive, not realistic. You might have felt this way in your job. We even say, oh, I feel like I'm stuck in a rut. Well, the scenic designer here actually built a rut in the floor. And by the way, did you notice it's a checkerboard floor? All right. And these people are stuck in a rut that they can't get out of. And so in this case, we turn the expressive feeling into an actual physical piece of the presentation. That was good. Let's dig a little deeper into surrealism. Theater that attempts to express the workings of the subconscious. So now we're just not just talking about symbols. We're not just talking about inner feelings. Now we're going to try to get into our subconscious, which is characterized by fantastic imagery and incongruous juxtaposition of subject matter. Just think about your dreams and how crazy they can be. That's your subconscious at work. These people believe that the subconscious is the eye to the soul. All right? Now, they always, people always say your eyes are the window to your soul. Now they're saying the subconscious is the eye of the soul. Key to knowledge is understanding dreams. 
and we come up with these fantastic artistic images that just don't make a lot of sense. We see a lot of figures, we see a lot of feelings, we don't understand, but we get some sort of emotional response. If you've ever been in a desert, that gives you an emotional response. <coughs> Excuse me. If you've ever drugged something heavy, that gives you an emotional response. Mimes, all right? This is obviously photoshopped. Mimes can't really float like that. However, mimes can do some really remarkable and slightly creepy things uh, that seem out of realism and into more things of expressionism. And certainly they do things that can look surreal. Musicals are surreal in their very nature. People in real life, normal people in real life, don't burst into song. There's not an orchestra on standby and there's not choreography that everyone magically knows. So musicals by their very nature are surrealistic. Um, and because of that, some people really don't like them, and some people absolutely love them. Now here's another part of the musical. If this person was really in the floor, he'd be dead. He couldn't function. He would have no lungs. Um, but in this case, he's just in a hole in the floor, and so it is a symbol, it's expressive, and it's also surreal. This is a famous play called Fuddy Mirrors, and she lives as multiple pieces in different drawers of this chest. Now, this is the same actress, so you have to have an actress who is incredibly flexible, but this is surreal. There's no way that it kind of logically makes sense. It's only something that we would see in a dream. And Salvador Dali's very famous melting clocks. Salvador Dali, the artist, trying to let us know that time is literally just a human construct. Ever since man has been on the planet, we have tracked time. Whether that was sunrise to sunset or the movement of the sun through the seasons, the tilt of the earth, now a second is the time that it takes for a cesium atom at the world clock to decay a certain amount. That's beyond my understanding, but that's what a second is. And now we are ruled by this concept of time. We must be on time. It's bad to be late, but it's really just a human construct that we have forced on ourselves. And that is kind of absurd. So that brings me to absurdism, not quite what we're assuming it's going to be. Absurdism is really specific to theater, and it's theater that explores the absurdity of human life. And I don't mean, ha ha, this is funny. I mean, human life is just kind of, it has no meaning, it has no purpose. This gets a little dark. We struggle through an unpredictable universe. This is part of one of the darkest responses to the world wars. Uh, and we come up with plays by Samuel Beckett and the like. Here is Endgame. This is Clav and Ham, servant and master. And the parents are in these trash bins down front. And they are all stuck in a room together. And they talk about leaving. And there's even a chance to leave but they are simply stuck there, unable to move forward. And they talk about it, and they try to explore it, and they try to talk about what's the meaning of life. And they come to the conclusion that there is no meaning to it. It's all just absurd. Existentialism. So absurdity went so dark that we have the existentialists. Existentialism, the root word being exist, theater that centers on the importance of the individual experience in a hostile or indifferent universe. All right? This universe either doesn't care or it's out to get you, and it stresses the importance of freedom of choice and responsibility for consequences of one's actions. So it's almost come full circle to realism, because realism was why do we behave the way we do based on heredity and social standing and circumstances and birth? Well, this is now, you've got a lot of choices and you've got the responsibility for those choices. And this is No Exit by French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. We staged this several years ago. We took it to a play festival. It did very well. This is about three people in hell. They're brought in they meet each other, they're trying to figure out who they are and why they're there, 
and by the end of it they have come to the conclusion that hell is other people that you cannot escape from. And if you've ever been in Houston traffic, you probably understand a little bit of what that feels like. It is examining why we exist and the choices that we made to get where we wound up. These three characters, not nice people for different reasons. That's why they wound up where they did, unable to escape each other. And then finally we come to eclecticism. Eclecticism. I can never say that one right. And that's where we are today, all right? We've had Shakespeare. We've had melodramas. We've had the Italian Renaissance. We've had realism. We've had vaudeville. We've had naturalism. And then we have all these isms, symbolism, expressionism, absurdism, surrealism. And today... We use all of it, all the time. Eclecticism is theater that relies on the practitioner's ability to mix and match all of the isms. Modern theater continues to combine, extract, and define through previous movements. So if you're watching something right now on Netflix or Hulu, look at it. Probably it's going to be realistic in acting but the circumstances may be incredibly fanciful. Characters might be doing one thing that actually symbolizes another thing. There might be a moment in a dream sequence or a flashback where things seem a little more expressionistic. You might have characters wondering why they're even alive when the universe is out to get them this existential crisis, or the absurdism of what is going on. And that's where we are today. So that's a look at the isms of the 20th century.